Welcome to another, another episode, episode of, of Driving to the Res with Larry, Larry and, and Inelia. Inelia. Yeah, we're getting good yeah, at this. Yeah, we're getting good at it. <laughs> so today I thought we could talk about a couple of things which are the same thing. One of them is uh, a class that I'm design, uh, working on right now, which I'm, we're going to call cross-contamination of frequencies. Wow. Right? I don't know if that's what it's going to be called, but that's what it's about. Um, and it's all about high frequency, low frequency, and how to navigate that in our lives. As Larry said, high frequency individuals navigating a low frequency minefield yes a low frequency minefield uh, Larry came up with that one the other day I thought it was fabulous and very very descriptive and it's tied in with a topic that one of our walk with me now members requested because we asked them what kind of things would you like to, would support you right what kind of topics will support you going forward what do you want to um, hear and discuss or talk about and uh, she said, I want to know about shielding and cord cutting and that type of thing, which is related. It's actually the same thing, uh, but looked at from different perspectives. So that's what I thought we could talk about. What do you think? Excellent. Sounds good. I haven't got a lot of experience. Well, expertise. You might. But I definitely have a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a lot of experience navigating that minefield, huh? As Garth Brooks says, I have, uh, I don't remember how he said it now, it's in his one of his songs, got lots of friends in low places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> it's a country song. <laughs> it may or may not reflect my past or current lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that is true, that is true. So, one of the first things that I mentioned already and I want to talk about is how do these two relate? I think they're the same thing, but again, looked at from very different angles. When I look at uh, protection and shielding and stuff like that on current cutting, I often feel, I don't know if it's actual or true, but I feel that somebody coming in from that perspective is already in the victim-aggressor cycle because they have to protect themselves against aggressors. And when I, um, I've mentioned many times before that once you realize that nothing can happen with, to you without your agreement, whether that agreement is conscious, subconscious, or through programming or other things, low frequency firewalls or programs or whatnot, then it doesn't matter whether it's conscious or subconscious, you've agreed, right? And fear is one of those agreements. Fear because you're afraid somebody can hurt you, that gives them the permission to hurt you. You're saying, yeah, you can hurt me, literally saying that. So once the person processes all their fears and works on all of their programs and things, which is, you know, the entire body of work that I've worked for or with since 2010, and even before that actually, um, it's aimed at removing those low frequency programs and subconscious decision making and all that type of stuff so that person becomes a true sovereign. Once you're a true sovereign, you don't need any type of shielding, quite honestly. Um, but at the same time, many of us are very empathic, for example. So a lot of the stuff that we feel and the things that affect us are not even ours. They're not even ours. They're from the people in our environment on our planet. So the combo of the two, right? Um, and it's very much that essence of, well, I feel it, will it affect me or not? So for example, if I feel a sudden wave of fear going through me, I become curious, go, oh, you know, there's a, this part of the planet's being targeted with fear technology. And I just curious about it and it doesn't affect me, but my physical body gets a real bombardment and she's not happy about it at all. But we carry on and it doesn't affect the way 
um, we behave or we, st we don't start reacting instead of responding to that type of thing. At the same time, I do give her extra support, right? More water, more food, more rest and hugs and cuddles, maybe uh, bath salt and things like that. And that's the part that has to do with the cross contamination of frequencies, uh, which I believe is the same thing, right, as the other shielding and all that. But coming from a non-victim aggressor perspective, and from a instead of that, it comes from a perspective of what do I like, right? The the frequencies that I prefer to bathe myself in, as opposed to the frequencies that I find extremely unpleasant and I will avoid or get rid of in my, from my life. So it's the same thing, but the, the viewpoint or the way that you come into it is very different in my opinion. What do you think? Well, a couple of questions come up because my body, when I, you know, when I experience fear, the first thing that comes to my mind isn't, oh, this is an artificial thing on the planet. I need to, what is this about? What comes is my eyes get big and I look around and it's like, where's the threat, you know? Uh-huh. And um, <clears throat> so the, um, let's say I have a amulet of protection of some kind or a necklace of organites or a, a crystal, or a crystal in, in my pocket or uh -huh. a beautiful this or that around that's known by a large collective, the larger collective of humans on the planet to have protective qualities. Mm -hmm. So I might lean on it a little bit and say, well, I'm uh, protected from all this, so I'm not going to give it a lot of attention. And it could be a little card in my wallet. It could be a chi thing. It could be a feng shui thing. Who knows? It could be a lot of different things that provide that. Mm -hmm. I suppose that shield. Yeah. And so instead of feeling like I'm walking around naked without a shield, I feel like, yeah, there's forces that are around that are disruptive and I'm shielded from uh, being affected by them so that I can just say, well, maybe that is an external thing. Maybe that is somebody else's and I'm feeling empathetic about somebody else's issue. What's going on here? In other words, it gives me the few seconds of uh, pause to move out of reaction and into response. Into response, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, um, the true sovereign, where you're not, and you tread wherever you wish, and there's no fear. I mean, that's a state that seems to be like a Buddha state or something, you know? Like, one of those things you strive for, mm -hmm. or you have as a goal, maybe, uh, ten lives from now I might get to there. But not something <laughs> you're like, I think if I just take care of this today, tomorrow I'll be that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. seem achievable. Right. On, a, uh, on an immediate basis for a vast majority of people. Although, definitely, I'm sure there are outliers, and I see them now, now and then, and they, they're like a, something of an inspiration. It's like, my gosh, look at that. And then I see some of them that do the same thing that those ones do, and they get ate up by the tigers, so I don't know what to say <laughs> about it, you know? Yeah, that also, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's part of the agreement, you know. So I think the main aspect of it, and you've pointed it out perfectly, is that wearing amulets or carrying uh, sigils or cards or whatever, so protection, crystals and necklaces and whatever, there's nothing... Um, the, the difference between the sovereign and the person who is in the victim aggressor cycle, even though they both, both will be wearing the same uh, necklace, for example, protective necklace, one of them knows that they're not a victim, but they are in a war zone and they take precautions, right? Because we know for a fact that our frequency goes up and down during the day a million times. Just and depending when, on what we ate. <laughs> yeah, even depending on what we yeah, ate. How thirsty we might be. Uh -huh. Whether we got enough sleep, you know, because last night I hardly got any sleep. You know, Lucy started barking and she barked all night and kept me up all night. It's so funny because though, Lucy was up all night barking all night, so I slept soundly because yes, she had it covered. She had it covered and I was the opposite, I couldn't sleep. So it's like that, you know, and that amulet will give us the kind of like a, um, a leg up 
on keeping ourselves above water, right? Sort of like a life preserver. Yeah. Life jacket. You That's can swim, right. but you know, life jacket is with better. a life jacket on, you can also rest. Easier. Yeah. Okay. You're more, you have more chances of survival if you have a life jacket on. Well, you can rest. Yes. I can swim. Yes. Ten miles. Maybe in the warm water, but <laughs> in the cold water, in the cold water, so not so much. But you know what I mean. In the warm yeah. water, I don't need a life jacket. I'm not worried about drowning. Uh -huh. You know. But if I did fall in the water and bump my head, then I would have a hard time swimming. Yeah. So yeah. A life jacket would help. Mm -hmm. And if I'm swimming along and I have my life jacket on, a big wave comes and splashes me underwater. The life jacket pops me up all by itself. I don't have to like exert struggle. myself and struggle. Exactly. Yeah. So I can save my energy there. for other things like, you know, building a fire on a little piece of seaweed or something to keep myself warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's... In other words, allow yeah. more energy for other attention focus. Exactly, like, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Um, and the other is, you know, if you're afraid, like, and you haven't processed your fear, you're extremely vulnerable. And it doesn't matter how many amulets you put it on your neck or whatever. Very, yeah, that's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. You it's know, kind of one of those, you know, sorry to interrupt, but it just reminded me of something that mm -hmm. when I get messages about, you know, when we're going fishing, for example, do something like that, and I get the little message of take care of this, take care of this, the niggle, right? The niggles, yeah. And I ignore the niggle, that stuff happens. <laughs> if I don't ignore the niggle, if I deal with, like, maybe I got a spare piece of chain and a chain tool, <laughs> the drum's chain doesn't break. But if yeah. I don't have it, it, it does. will definitely break. Yeah. And uh, you know, if I don't bring the grease gun, same thing. Then everything that needed grease breaks because it didn't <laughs> get greased or, yeah. or whatever. But even if I brought it and didn't grease it, it still would be fine. I mean, and another one, uh, it's like a first aid kit. We had the niggle, and I put it on the board. Get the new first aid kit stocked. <laughs> right? Yeah. I put it on the board and uh, my daughter, it's her boat, she uh, took a picture of it and uh, before we go on the next trip, you take care of what's on the board uh -huh. to the best of your ability. Those are the niggles that need attention and the board is to help remind you of the niggles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were in, she was in her truck and her husband said, uh, she said, well, we need a new life, our uh, first aid kit. And he uh -huh. said, we have one in the truck here. He said, well, we should bring it. It's like, yep, we should bring it, and they didn't. Oh no! But oh they, no! They got that close. Yeah, that's like so very close. So maybe if they had brought it, we wouldn't need it. But as it was, they Somebody didn't bring it. And Somebody got injured, and then we had a bunch of band aids that were like from <laughs> 1940. Oh my god! <laughs> and so we didn't have any of the supplies that we really ought to have had. And then uh -huh. we, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. one's related to the other. It seems like. The yeah. protections, or the shields, or the amulets, or the pretties, the crystals, the cards, the things that you have with you. If it's a niggle and you have it, you won't need it. If it's mm -hmm. a niggle and you ignore it, then maybe it manifests. You know, and sometimes you get the niggle and you do it, and then it's fine. It's, you know, it's like, it's, the thing happens and you're fully prepared. Okay. That happens too. Yes. It does, but you're prepared yeah. for it. Yeah, you're fully prepared and, and it's, boom. It's, like, it's that great. was nice. I'm glad I had that ready. Exactly. And we've had plenty of those examples too, I think. So, so we can't really settle it down and say that this is for sure. Mm -hmm. There's many situations and many solutions and they all are different. But if you right. base these off of, I'm afraid, it's right. different than if you base these off of, I'm prepared. Exactly. So. One of the examples I like to use is if you're driving in a busy, very busy, fast city, let's say Dublin, Dubliners, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> or um, Paris, uh, right? Parisians, you know what I'm talking about. So far I'm lost. Uh, New York, <laughs> you know Not what I'm clue. talking about. <laughs> oh no. Okay, so it's, it's like a jungle out there. It's very, very high stress and very vi aggressive driving. Oh. Um, and you know you're 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 prepared for it, right? Um, so I now I've lost my, th <laughs> my, my your thread for your go with it. Well, basically, I was saying there's what's the the inspiration for the action? Prepare from your niggle. Oh, that's or right. Or I'm Thank afraid you. of all of these yes. things in yes. the whole planet. Yes. Just because that so, person's afraid, now I'm afraid. Exactly right. That's so you're in this busy city, right? Very aggressive city. 
and um, when you come to a red light you don't stop because you are afraid of getting smashed you stop because we have an agreement that the red traffic light means you stop so that the people in the green on the other side can go well you know this this is an agreement okay so you stop I'm pretty sure I stopped because I'm afraid I'm going to get smashed also. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I thought about just running through them and I get... No, I don't think so. Yeah, because you know that the other people have the green light. And sure. they have a go. Right? I am. So it's like discernment, caution, is our thing, are good things. But you know, every time you see a red light, you don't go into fear and stop because you're so afraid. That doesn't happen, you know, because there's an agreement, a collective agreement. Oh, okay, I stop and let other people go. And if I go, then they're going to smash into me, right? Well, how it's about knowledge. those countries that don't have those agreements that just they go on the red light or the green light and they don't care about which side of the road and they go, have you seen the videos I watch? So look, well, that's a different conversation. What oh. I'm expressing here is that there's some, you will stop in New York, Dublin, Madrid, Paris, at a red light, New York, right? You will stop at the red light because there's so much traffic and they're so aggressive that you know for a fact that if you go through that red light, you're gonna get smashed into and hurt yourself and others. You know this, so you stop, right? So that's one thing, this is the agreements. We know there's a rule, we've made it up, right? A rule of green lights and red lights and stuff so that we can take turns to get to where we want to go. And we abide by those agreements and we keep each other safe. So those, those are a set of rules, a set of agreements and things that we abide with. And usually, not always, but usually they work, right? Because sometimes, yeah, some people go through the red lights and next thing you know, you're yeah, dead. You know, we learned, right? I learned defensive driving. When you go into an intersection and the light turns green, be sure and double check because exactly. there'll be people trying to run the red light. They do, yeah. So, you're you know prepared this, this. in the sense That's of aware. Exactly. Expanded awareness. You look, you're defensive driving, not because you're, well. Afraid, but you know, it's like discernment and experience. You know, there's people who, you know, especially new drivers, who will try and push it and go very last second. Or drunk ones. Or drunk ones, yeah. Because they have nice, nice spirits driving. The yes. spirits ain't afraid of no red light. No, they the would spirits. like what happened if you go through red light uh -huh. smash. <laughs> Looking for one of those experiences. Exactly. So. We know this and we're, we do that, right? We, we, we are very cautious and everything, and that's one experience. Just because you're not afraid, doesn't mean that you can go through those red lights and not get smashed into. That's what I'm saying. So you may be okay. completely fearless and think, oh, because I'm fearless and I process all my fear around red lights, I can go through the red lights and never get smashed. I guarantee within, by the end of the day, you will be in a car wreck because it goes against the collective agreement, right? Right, now that's the more, that's the more, more important distinction than uh, fear yeah. or protection or non-fear yes. or non-protection. It's the collective Agreements. agreement. Uh -huh. And that's the basis of our conversation is about yeah. polluted with lower frequencies and or also now, contaminations and yes. things like that. And now we're also talking and about, agreements. and we've talked about a couple of episodes already, it is a physical body attack that's happening on the planet right now. So all these EMFs and all the masks and all the pushing to vaccinations and stuff. Constant those reminders are assault of fear. And a constant assault on our physical bodies. So it doesn't matter how much you're not afraid of EMFs. I'm not afraid of EMFs, for example. It doesn't mean my body doesn't get affected by the EMFs being bombarded on the planet right now. It most certainly does get affected, and I do get very, very sick after a little while. And right? the agreement isn't a necessarily personal; it's a co, co collective agreement. Yeah, collective. But the you can bodies, have an a, you can have right? an individual agreement, but it mm -hmm. is overruled by a collective agreement. Is that exactly, what Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I'm not afraid of EMFs. I don't care about them at all. But my physical body gets highly affected by them. Right. So, I need to be very cautious and take care of her and now we have a canopy over our bed that protects us from EMS at night and that has made a huge difference to my physical body. So, you know, and there's certain foods that my physical body is not tolerant of and if I eat those foods I will get very sick. 
So I avoid those foods. Not because I'm afraid of them, because my physical body has a bad reaction to it. So there's the, the, the knowledge. Now, yes, there are individuals who can overcome all of those collective agreements, including their physical body intolerances and things. Like yogis who can walk over fire, coals, you know, um, whatever those are called, the, the burning coals very slowly and they don't get burnt. Or eat glass and knives, uh, razor blades, and they don't die. And those yogis have made a, done a lot of work for decades to get into a state where they have complete and absolute control of what affects their physical bodies and what doesn't. But it takes a lot of work and it doesn't just happen. And I, I personally am a very powerful person, but I haven't done that work. So if I walk slowly over coals, I'm going to get terribly burnt and I'm going to end up at the ER. Because my physical body and I have not done that work. And my physical body will get affected on the basis of the human collective agreement that physical bodies are fluffy, you know, they're very delicate. I think, I think that you might be wrong on this one. I think it's more likely that Gaia would put a giant rainfall right on top of those fires. <laughs> Just be before. Burnt. <laughs> I don't think you'd get burned. <clears throat> yeah, but there wouldn't be fire there by the time I walked, so it would be like wet, yeah. cold, cold, right? Yes, exactly. Because I think... <laughs> I think there's a, there's a safety was, valve in place. Uh, oh, she would send a Larry to grab me and stop me. <laughs> stop you. <laughs> so. That's a little bit like the shields. Yes. I um, suppose that's a <laughs> Yeah, so we use a canopy as a shield against the physical thing. And this past two weeks, I've been working on creating dozens and dozens of plants for the inside of the house. And the way that I do it is very ceremonial. I talk to the plants, each little seedling and little plant. I talk to them and I connect with them. What do you need? How can I support you? And I have the soil is very well. Um, it was chosen by Hopi, our friend and co-creator at the Shaman Shack. And um, I put crystals in all the in all of the plant pots, and I bought really nice ones, plant pots as well, so that the energy of beauty goes into the plant pot and feeds the plant. And the crystals are there basically to help purify the environment, as are the plants, that's their job, purify the environment. I bought some spider plants and those vines, <laughs> nobody knows the name of, but they're very popular. And then this morning, do you remember the vines? They had water on them in the house. In the house, they had droplets of water all over their leaves. On the leaves. tips of their leaves, and yeah. nobody watered them. Yeah, it's, it's, it that was, was really remarkable. bizarre. Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but it was magical because the light was coming in and it was shining on the droplets and beautiful. <laughs> it doesn't rain in the house. No, it doesn't rain in the house. <laughs> so... There are things that we do, and there, the ones that I was doing with the plants were based on beauty and purification, right? So there's lots of things that you can do with regards to shielding. I often tell people, sage your place, especially after somebody who was low frequency has gone to your house and been there, even if it's for like a short visit. Um, when they leave, you purify it. I mean, if they're open to it, you can sage them too. Uh, but usually you, 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 you wait until the guest leaves and then you, you sage your house or do it at least once a week. Just generally speaking, it's good to, clear, to cleanse your house just like you dust it and you vacuum it. You can also purify it energetically because we're in a very polluted environment on the planet. And that's a fact. <laughs> so that helps you, helps your house. It supports everybody that lives in the house, including all your pets and plants. Um, and also I would do a ceremony of shielding with regards to frequencies, energies and uh, beings. Only allowing high frequency individuals and beings into the house. You can seal it with salt. Uh, you do the, all the surrounding of the house plus also all the window sills and the doorways and uh, you can create a grid of uh, power by putting crystals in all the corners and then sealing it you by intent and you can do a little ceremony 
around that. There is a beautiful cleansing uh, ritual um, that I created. It's on YouTube. Uh, Daniela and I recorded it in a hotel several years ago. You can go to YouTube and then put cleansing in Elia, and then in Elia Benz on the search and you'll get that video if you want to know how to cleanse a room or, ha or a house. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can do and I would go from the perspective of being street smart, know that we are still in an environment that's both light and dark and we need to take, you know, it's, it's a good idea to brush your teeth every day, <laughs> right? Because of what you're ingesting or whatever. And it feels good. So that's that's the difference, I think, a different energy to I'm totally afraid of being bombarded and, and being attacked and I want to stop people and beings from attacking me. That's a very low frequency way to look at it and it's an agreement for them to hurt you. That's beyond the collective agreement of what's happening here. Um, sometimes I will tell people, uh, you know, there's energetic bullets flying around so you know, keep your head down. <laughs> or if you're sticking your head up, put an armor on because there are bullets flying around. It's nothing personal, but if you stick your head out, you're gonna get hit. So put a helmet on and you're good. <laughs> you just hear a big clunk. <laughs> but it won't be like, you know, blow your head off. <laughs> so what do you think about that? Well, it's, um, it's like most things on this planet. It's not cut and dried. And there are a lot of circumstances. And um, the, I guess the basic bottom line is when you have fear, process it. And when you make a choice, decision about a, a thing, you can do it from fear, which generates and agrees with the collective. Fear means you're afraid, then you're power, less powerful, and all those things. You've entered into it arrangement, let's right, say, right. an arrangement with the collective that is really happy to oblige you. <laughs> yes. And um, if you process your fear, the even if it's, you know, if, hey, oh my god, I'm scared of what might happen if I get a flat tire, and then you process your fear around, maybe I get a flat tire and it's raining outside and somebody stops by and then they knock me on the head and kidnap me, right? I mean, that's... So I'm going to get a XYZ so I don't get a flat tire and then you end up with a flat tire and the thing that you got doesn't work to fix the flat tire and you still get bonked on the head. It's like, that's the cycle, right? The cycle of fear, victim, aggressor, all that other stuff. Yeah. So if uh, we have the fear of getting a flat tire because of might get bonked on the head, whatever, and then process that fear so that that isn't really a motivating factor anymore, then re-examine the flat tire thing and say, what is the message about the flat tire thing? And then come to the realization that, oh, it's kind of inconvenient. I'll have a phone number I can just call. Mm -hmm. Or I'll have one of these little cans in the car. If I get a flat tire, it's just a, no big deal. I'll call a number or I'll fill, fill it with this thing. And it may be that it never ever happens again. Yeah, yeah. So you've taken an action after processing a fear mm -hmm. and not from a sense of, oh my gosh, but a sense of, yeah, that would be sensible. I don't want to be hassled. Right. With a and the other, um, the other is that scene could be you get a niggling. Niggling, yeah. Yeah, you get a niggling. Mm, what if I got a flat tire? Oh, I better get one of those scan things. And, yeah, you know, just in case. Just in case if you put it in your trunk, and then ten minutes later you have a flat tire and you use the can and carry on. So when you follow your niggles, right? It's like cars can tell you if you're connected to your car because it, the universal intelligence is in everything, right? right? In everything, everything's sentient. And you get the, the, the message, you know, like often I would get the message of, Larry, we need to fix X, Y, Z, or look at X, Y, Z on the truck. And if we ignored it, it, sure enough, a few days later, boom, it's gone, done. 
Yeah, so basically follow your niggle but not interfere. Exactly. Follow That's your it. niggle because you know that there's more than you orchestrating and co-creating an environment. And part of that environment is that mechanical objects like cars do break down sometimes. Right? And understand that you receive information. Yes, the receiving All information the time. will support you. And the receiving of the information is to support you. The taking it into fear is the minefield. Right, that's the minefield because then not only are you afraid, but it opens up all sorts of nasty stuff, right? And then opens you start you up. to close off to the niggles so that yes. you don't. You see how it turns into this vicious, like yes. one thing is connected to the other, connected to the other. Yeah. The overriding one thing, if you ever take it out of it, all of it is process the fear if you go there. Yes. If your niggle brings you to a fear, process your fear. Uh-huh. If the data that you receive through any source takes you to fear, process your fear. That's right, yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Allow the information without the fear. And then it may be that you take an action. It may be that you, uh, if the truck breaks, I don't care. I'll deal with it if it breaks. I don't care if I deal with it today or deal with it in a week. I'm <laughs> same difference to me. <laughs> so I can ignore the niggle and go for a hike. Yeah. <laughs> or, I mean, everyone's different in their tolerance for what they're willing to deal with. But right, right, yeah. The niggle of a flat tire for me, uh, you know. Not much bother you got your I spare don't tire. I one or the other. Yeah. Good tire, flat tire, uh uh. <laughs> if yeah. I see a can for a fix a flat, yeah, I might toss it in a truck. Yeah. But I'm not going to go to Washburn's and go buy one in special. Right, right. Although, oh, I will remember that say, time. I remember that time. Say, remember that time. I will say. Okay. Go ahead. Remember that time. I remember that time. No, I when don't. you had the niggle and to did. put this that can in the truck. Yes, yes. And you did. Yes. And then we were driving back home and your auntie called. Yes. Said, I've got a flat tire. It wasn't that. your auntie. Uh, it was your... Um, wasn't that kind? Uh, I don't remember who it was, but it wasn't for us. Lou. Uh, Luan. Luan. Yeah, it was Luan. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, oh yeah, I said, yeah. That's she called you. I'm in trouble. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. I've got a flat tire. I'm over at Port Angeles. Says, oh, I'm nearly there. Okay, I'll just pop in. Yeah. And you went over and you had the can in the car and boom, she was fixed, right? That was a good lesson there. So. Listen sometimes to the niggle yeah, and, sometimes made, it's and allow about you. yourself to be the <laughs> part of the um, orchestration. The part of the orchestration of, of the high frequency result. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Listen to the niggle, process your fear. Uh -huh. I think that's what we've come to. Yep, yeah. yeah. And then take actions and do the things that do support things. your physical body. Knowing and being street smart, right? Knowing that there's stuff going on on the planet. And we're not, not we're not omnipotent. And so, our physical bodies are vulnerable. Is it right? arrogance? That is the low frequency response to ignoring your niggle? Oh yes. That would be yes, arrogance, yes. right? Absolutely. You say, oh, I don't need no bloody can I be to protect me from EMFs, you know? I'm gonna I don't be just agree fine. You're talking from a so usually what I find when people say that is they're talking from a soul perspective, and you're absolutely right. Your soul doesn't need any type of protection from anything. Doesn't need protection from EMFs or DMFs or <laughs> DNVs or DTTs or, DTTs or, XYZ, or XYZs or fats or anything. Or too much sugars or no, anything. No, nothing. Really. It's nothing, ne at all. nothing. So if you're looking at it solely from a soul perspective, it needs nothing. And I can attest to that because for most of my life, I only existed and lived from that perspective, the soul perspective. Right. And I couldn't give a damn about my body, about how she felt or how she was doing, you know, and I got some serious health issues that nearly took me out. Um, did I care? No, not one little bit. Take me out, I don't Take care. Me, I don't care, right? Yeah. But then I learned to connect with the physical body, proper to, I, I've been working on connecting with her, and supporting her was huge, a huge improvement in lifestyle and everything. And I realized, wait, this is not about me. This is about my physical body, right? And I, t I need to take care of her because who else is gonna, right? So, actually, Larry is, but <laughs> in my case, it's but a usually, yeah. So, but usually, it's like you know, your your physical body depends on you 100. percent So, yeah, it's to total arrogance to to think that oh yeah, I can just intend that EMS won't affect me, and you know. 
like not a negative arrogance it's just the soul perspective I would say but the soul perspective doesn't include the body and the body just like it needs sleep every night and if you intend that you don't need sleep after about a week or two you're gonna go crazy your physical body will take you out and the same with food you need to work a lot and a lot of a lot to be able to say become a breath breatharian or sun gazer to just not need any food you need to work on it with your physical body and with your physical body's agreement you can do it but what's not going to work is that from one day to the next you without any preparation without any dedication or anything just stop eating and say okay my intent is going to keep me going because you don't have the know-how you don't know what to do you don't know the mechanics between it's you know. almost like that is the arrogance. It's like, I'm going to do it to my physical body instead of with my physical body. Yes. And well, also without any training, I'll do it. Right? I'll climb Everest without it. Well, nowadays you can because it's totally polluted and it has a, a queue going up and down. Uh, but let's say, you know, you bought a sailboat and you decided, I'm going to get a sailboat. I'm going to go sailing. You put it in the water and off you go. You haven't watched any YouTubes, not one. You don't know how to even open the hatch to get into the, the, the cabin. You don't know what any of the buttons inside do or anything. You don't know what a sail is, you know, or how to unwrap it from the pole or anything. And you just go sailing. <laughs> well, I read that book, actually. The boy did that from Australia because he wanted to get home to England yeah. after the war. But, but did he didn't know how to sail and he didn't have YouTubes. And did and he, he have bought a anybody? Sailboat. And he only made it a little ways and he sank his first one. Yeah. So, so that's what one. happens. He right? learned the hard way. That's what happens. Yeah. You sink your sailboat <laughs> and you <laughs> might die. He might have died. Because that's arrogance, right? That's the arrogance. Thinking that, you know, you can do it without any preparation. Often when um, um, people that have artistic ability or, or like an intent of being an artist or a writer, let's say a writer, right? Because I'm more familiar with writers. Um, They'll say, yeah, I'm, I want to be a writer and I want to write books. That's my goal and my aim. And I, I've always wanted to write a book. And I asked him, well, how many words a day do you write today? And like now, oh, none. Yeah, you need to start by writing, say, like, let's start with 500 words. Let's work our way up to 2,000 words a day. After about a week, they come back and say, you know what? I'm done with writing. I'm, I don't actually want to be a writer. <laughs> I like done. the idea of being able to the action of doing it. No. And the same with painting, you know, like I have individuals who want to be an artist and then they do one drawing and it doesn't come out like Van Gogh's paintings and they go, ah, I'm done with this. I, I'm not good at it. And it says, really? Well, what do you think Van Gogh's first drawing looked like when they were a child? And they go, oh, it's a stickman. Yeah, like a stickman, right? So it took years decades for him to get that good and it's you know if you if you assume that it's like that instant gratification thing right if you don't get it in the first week then you're not good at it <laughs> and that that reminds me of my son's football Cameron's football his, uh, his teammates they've come to the realization that they all seem to come to the realization at one point or another you know they're obviously extremely good at their game like football for Stanford that's name dropping, by the way. <laughs> but at some point, they have this realization that to continue, they have to love the act of like working out and uh, exercise and running and um, a drills of, a and of all of the everything else. The game is like one Tiny an hour percentage. or whatever, <laughs> a teensy little bit of it, and that's rewarding in it and it is it got a lot of uh, something from satisfaction, it satisfaction yeah. from it. but they have to have at least if not more satisfaction for the 98 percent of the day they're doing all those other things running around the track and sweating and pulling on each other i don't know whatever else they do yeah. but you know Lifting if they weights, don't enjoy that, that process as much if not more than the game process then they're not going to be successful in continuing right right yeah. and so it's similar if you don't like drawing I guess, the, having a pencil in your hand and a piece of paper and just drawing stuff, mm -hmm. whether or not it turns out to be anything, I guess, then you're probably not going to be a fantastic artist, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah, you need and to if you know, if you don't just love sitting at your computer or your paper writing and typing and writing and typing and making all these little stories, you're not going to want to write a novel. You're not going to have the, what it, probably. If you'd rather be outside in the yard or hiking. <laughs> you're not going to be a good writer. Than sitting in front of a piece of paper or a computer, then yeah. You're, you're not going to make a good writer. It's not going to happen. But sense. also, my point is it needs a lot of practice. So the arrogance comes in, oh, well, if I don't get it first time, then, you know, it's not for me. And I, you know, I'm not good at it or I don't like it. Okay. You need to try something. I always tell people, try something for six months before you give up on it. Okay. Because it'll give you a level of seeing your progress, seeing the, the way that it moves forward. And then you can keep record of the first attempt and the attempt that you have six months later. And then you can really, literally see your progress. When I, would, when I was mentoring people, I would tell them to write all of their goals and everything the first day, and I tell them to write a report if after every meeting with me, and um, they send homework reports every three days and everything, and that's not for my benefit. It's for theirs, because the process of growth and awareness and empowerment comes through slowly, so slowly you can hardly perceive it and they could end up six months later and says, this is useless, I haven't achieved anything. So I say, well, look at your writing from six months ago and they look at it and go, oh my God, I'm a different that? person. <laughs> I'm a different person now. Yeah, totally I can't true. believe that I was writing that stuff six months ago. I can't believe that I had those issues or problems six months ago. And I can't believe I couldn't figure it out six months ago. So it's like, you can see it, right? Yeah. You can see it, you stick to it and you can see it. Um, and by the way, I'm not taking any more mentories. <laughs> not, that's not a plug-in or anything. That's just an example of what can happen and how it progresses. Uh, so arrogance can come in in very, very many forms. And it's the other side of the comma of worthlessness, right? Also, it's the same coin, but different expressions of it. Also, the arrogance can come in with the shield. Can you explain that further? Sure. Now you have this little magic underwear, like. And then you can go through red lights. Exactly. <laughs> Is that also the arrogance? Yes. Yeah, that can happen. That can happen. That can happen. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> 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 just threw a monkey wrench. <laughs> That's like the opposite of fear, right? That's arrogance too. That's yeah. arrogance. Yeah. And arrogance is also, remember at some point or another, they all reel down into a fear. fear. So what is arrogance actually, how is that related to fear? Not being good enough, I think. But arrogance, you think you're more than good enough, isn't it? Well, it, like I said, it's the same coin. It's just two sides of it. It's actually the same energy. It says you're you're more than good enough. You're better than everybody else. Yeah. Or exactly you're totally worthless. You're not good, and you're worse than everybody else. So it's the same energy. It's the same coin, just the sides of it. Okay. And often I found people go from one extreme to the other on that one. And you know when somebody comes to me and says. Uh, you know, Inelia, I know you told me to brush my teeth every day, but I don't need to because it's unhealthy and I, you know, I don't actually have to wash, brush my teeth. I get, well, my response is, brilliant, okay, cool. I'd love to hear your results in six months. And it's genuine, it's genuine. I would like to see your results in six months because if that person comes back in six months and their teeth are absolutely beautiful and healthy and everything. I want to know exactly what they did. What was their diet? What, what is it that they're doing that other people are not doing? That if they don't brush their teeth every day, they get cavities. And why did this person not get their cavities? I want to know because I like to open the hood and things and find tools and things that are simple. And I want to know how they did it, right? What was it within their lifestyle that is different to other people and managed to get really healthy teeth, you know. Well, that was Weston Price, remember? Yes. I know this is a specific answer to a general, like a 
question, but if anybody's curious about teeth things, look up Western Price. Yeah, and I think you said that brushing wasn't much relevant. You well, know, it was more yeah. like you, the, what, you what you ate. It was what you Yeah. And the fat, soluble vitamin A, D, and K, or what some eat, mystery yeah, exactly, thing. Yeah. And some very strange things, and especially when you were pregnant with the baby, so your teeth are the product of your mother's diet. Right. <laughs> and so. just to throw another wrench there, when I was little, I had the worst teeth ever. I had terrible, terrible teeth. My baby teeth were messed up, man. There's so many cavities you cannot imagine. And then when my big teeth started coming in, I decided, as a person, hold on a minute, I don't want to have bad, because my mom had the worst teeth and my sister too, I don't want to have bad teeth, I want to have really beautiful, strong teeth. And that's what I got. I'm in my mid fifties and I think I have like four cavities all together. One for each child, <laughs> right? That's so, a funny way to put it. Yeah, um, it's actually something they tell you in Britain, you know, oh, you know, your teeth are perfect, but you start having babies, you're gonna get one cavity at least per child. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so got from one. that no sleep. <laughs> yeah. And uh, whatever you Leaching drink. Leaching of the stuff. Leaching you know, of the, of the minerals nutrients and minerals nutrients. and stuff from the baby. Again, it comes to diet. So, yeah, I had a really bad diet at the time. Doritos and Coca Cola. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not the diet I had when I was pregnant. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it does. You do have, you can have that effects. You can have those. But it takes a certain amount of. And it wasn't done with arrogance, it was like a knowing, it was different energy, completely different. So even today, I stop at red lights because I know the collective agreement is stronger than my will. So I might get away with one or two red lights in a busy city, but forget it after <laughs> after a while, eh, not so good. <laughs> yeah, for you, that's a little bit like the uh, restaurants and the cooks with open doors. Yep, I mean, anybody yep. with an open You're door is gonna get you through that red light. Absolutely. You're not down. alone. You're not alone in this environment. Yeah. And there's a lot of co-creators and co-players in here too. So try not to play the game with mm -hmm. them. Play your own game, man. Exactly. In so yeah, so that's part of that cross-contamination of frequencies, right? Yeah. Like the what Larry said when you go to restaurants. Yeah. When I go to a restaurant, I scan the restaurant to see if there's any addicts in the kitchen. Which invariably there are. Yes. Most, I don't know if anybody's think, worked in a restaurant I think before. Ninety-five percent of the time, it's a yes. That's pretty much a hundred percent, actually. Yes. I ha actually, I think I remember two restaurants I went to. There weren't any. Wow, that's impressive. In I'm my entire way. lifetime, and <laughs> I, I've gone to gazillions because one of the things I like was to eat out, and I've been to gazillion restaurants. And um, so, yeah, one of them was. A restaurant in Sacramento, it was Il Fornell, which was a chain restaurant, but it was in Sacramento City. And they didn't have any addicts there. Most of the time, I remember once there was. But also in that restaurant, we had a, a waiter who absolutely protected me like crazy. So, so he would triple check, yeah, he would triple check my food before it left the kitchen. Before it left the kitchen, he would triple check it. Trip, you know, check that there. Everybody who prepared it knew my allergies, and then checked in again with them. And then before he brought it out, he would actually literally look at the plate and bring it out. He probably learned over a few times. He did. Yes. <laughs> like, no matter what he says, it's still going to pop in. Yes. So, um, yeah. So what he, Larry was referring to is that I will scan, and if there's an addict, I will check and check and check again that there's no ingredients in my food that I'm allergic to even though we told the waitress or waiter several times what they are and they insist that no 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 it's fine I will look at my plate and invariably there will be ingredients in there that I specifically said not to put in and they're always shocked and they always go back to the kitchen and they're always nobody knows how they got there right always yeah so it's like that. I know that we co-create things and we go into somebody's restaurant. It's their co-creation that we're stepping into and their environment. And basically, we, I know, and part of my street smart is, um, yeah, those places are places where those negative open doors can be used to make me feel uncomfortable on the planet, you know, or take me out. So 
So is there a shield or something that would protect you from that? Uh, street smarts. I know the knowledge. I have the knowledge. I scan, right? And it just the protection shield that I have is check my food every time it arrives. It's just street smarts. Because it's a, it is a co-creation. I have no control over who works in that restaurant. But I do have control with it to go in there or not. And checking my food or not checking my food. Right? And I also have... Another shield is the antihistamines that I carry in my in my purse, right? And I have those, and if I find that a place is, yeah, if there's more than one addict in that kitchen, I will take those in with me. And um, if I feel I eat before I realize the ingredients are in there, I will pop one of those antihistamines and I'll be fine. I think we need to have another episode of this because this is really complicated. <laughs> Sure. I'm not satisfied with all of these things yet. Yeah. But for now, be street smart, right? Yeah, be street smart and process your fear, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, yeah. Listen to your niggles. Yeah. And um, I think that there's value to the shields in the sense that what we discussed, which was to give you the pause to process your fear, mm -hmm. but not to go and move into arrogance, right? Right, right. So... No, I there's suppose that's okay. no, there's bullets flying, and it's not personal. And if you wear like a helmet or you know, vest, it's just clever, right? <laughs> so my personal preference is for a pretty crystal instead of a bottle of uh, antihistamines to be a shield. <laughs> but I suppose that's part of uh, part of. Um, yeah, because I'm not always in a high frequency myself, right? I'm not yeah. always there, so. So the cross-contamination of frequencies would be basically when you allow your frequency to lower, mm -hmm. then you can be cross-contaminated. Yes, that's what happens. And if you happens. haven't got a low frequency or you're not willing to, I guess the word would be um, not negotiate your frequency, but uh, compromise your frequency. If you have absolute integrity about no compromise with your frequency, you wouldn't even go in a restaurant with a low frequency. Pre exactly, you? right. So yes. we don't... We don't currently live in the paradigm where that exists, where mm -hmm. every restaurant and all of the places and spaces that you would go match your high frequency. Right. We There's have a mixed frequency right exactly. now. Exactly. We have in the middle of the splitting, mm -hmm. the lower frequency ones become more lower frequency, and the higher frequency ones I don't more know, visible. More I guess. visible, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're navigating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are definitely minefields, and yeah. uh, preparedness isn't the same as fear. Right. It depends on the motivating energy mm -hmm. and your ability to process the fear that might arise from yeah. your niggles. Yeah. Okay, I think I think I feel satisfied. You know, yes, and also like the the email I sent out about um batting down the hatches, I said get food for a few weeks or a couple of months, prepare yourself. You may never use that food. Because it's not about the food, it's about your physical body and the bombardment that your physical body is going to get from the fear of all this upheaval, wondering if it's going to have food yeah, to eat yeah, and your yeah, children yeah. will have food to eat. Once you satisfy that, you're going to feel great. Your physical body is covered and it's going to support you. You may never, ever eat that food. It closes the door exactly. for that entering. Exactly. That's part of that shielding too. That is, yeah. yeah. That's preparedness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is. cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. I got it. Yeah. So, go to ineliabens.com for all my tools and things, information, hundreds of articles there that will help you uh, step into empowerment. Because I remember, an awakened person is not necessarily a sovereign or a powerful individual. So, we want to get every awakened person to be sovereign and powerful. It, well, you know. Some awakened people are dark workers too, so <laughs> right. maybe we don't want that. <laughs> no, well, I'm talking about high, high frequency. frequency. High frequency. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, go to walk with me now for your tribe and co creators that are absolutely freaking amazing. And Speaking of which, we forgot to mention talk with me now. Oh, yes. They, part of Walk With Me Now was uh, it's a Talk With Me Now telegram that you can only access through Walk With Me Now, created by the users uh, at Walk With Me Now, the members. 
And it's amazing. It's like a Telegram group that fills you with high frequency all day long. If you thought you were alone, <laughs> forget this it. will satisfy forget it. And You're not alone. And completely eliminate you are that not thought. Alone. If you want to wake up with, I mean, all you really got to do is go hide your phone for a couple of days. You'll have a thousand high frequency high messages frequency waiting messages for you waiting when you for connect. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's different to Facebook and all those because yeah, that's... it's a closed group, you know, and um, members all over the world and uh -huh. wow, it's really, really amazing. So. There's always somebody awake because it goes across <laughs> the entire planet. It does, yeah. And I yeah. have yet in the time that it's been up been impacted in any way by what I would call a low frequency minefield in there none, no, none not none, once not once uh -huh. it's just a example of what high frequency pod would be like exactly or it is it's well it would be it is yes. like it's like yes so if you want to experience a high frequency pod go i can there. tell you how mm -hmm. you go to walk with me now yeah it has a cost associated with it to keep everything running and you know do high frequency projects like we do yeah and it has an open door access to talk with me now and the Walk With Me Now Forum, both high-frequency pods, the way to have high-frequency engagements with other high-frequency individuals. Yeah, yeah. moderated and, <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. it's awesome. <laughs> Alrighty then, that's it for today. Okay. We'll, okay. Maybe we, we'll have another conversation that's related to this one. I think so, because that's our, you know, that's one of the main topics of the, of the split for uh, high-frequency people is how to navigate the low-frequency minefield. It is. Uh -huh. It really is. It, it really is, yeah. And Peavy's been sneezing. <laughs> it's okay. She's cute. Enough. She's a cute puppy. Yeah. Okay. Right. I feel that. How about you? Yeah. That's great. Okay. I love you, honey. I love you too, honey. <laughs>